This event has no commercial sponsorship, no affiliation with any organization, academic, commercial, or political. Um, everything that we are saying here um, for Elsie and myself are our own personal opinions and not representing the organizations uh, to whom we look for sustenance. Um, Steve is the um, town uh, health director for Wallingford and um, you know does speak on in, in that capacity. Uh, you need to keep in mind that um, um, life is messy. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties in the media. You've been hearing conflicting remarks from people and the science is not fully understood. We are not setting ourselves up as omniscient that have knowledge of truth and light, but we'll tell you what our opinions are and try to make things a little more understandable so that you can make your own decisions as to what you um, choose to, uh, to consider. Um, I am a physician at Yale New Haven, a professor of lab medicine, and I'm president of the radio club as well. And again, I speak for myself. Um, I'll be the event moderator. Uh, we won't be having any slides because we thought that would be make it easier for everyone to understand if we didn't have complex slides and play around with the, making sure everyone could see them. Also on the panel, Elsie uh, WB1IFZ. Um, she's the director of data management for Pfizer. Uh, and again, uh, she will tell you no support from Pfizer has been received. And she speaks for herself and not on behalf of, of the company. Uh, and Steve is the director of health for the town of Wallingford and president of the Connecticut Association of Directors of Health. Uh, the format will be for each of us to talk about 10 minutes. Those of you who know me know I'll probably speak 11.5 minutes or something like that. And then uh, we'll go to Elsie and then Steve, and then we'll open it up for questions. So we should have about uh, at least a half hour, 40 minutes or more for questions. And uh, Ms. Farrell will feel the questions and pop them to us, and then I'll decide, I'll, I'll choose which of the three of us uh, should answer it. Uh, the tough ones going to the other two and the easy ones I'll take. Uh, we'll provide, uh, this is only for information. It is not our intent to convince you or to take or not take the vaccine. Um, we're not trying to proselytize anyone. We're just trying to give you science and data. Um, and um, if you want to ask a question, there's a chat little thingy at the bottom. Someone's already decided to chat. And uh, with that, we'll get started. So, um, and if you could please put your phones on mute so we don't hear the barking dogs or other things. Um, so what is a vaccine and why do we need one? Um, a virus is a, is a pathogen, which is basically an evil entity, has one purpose in life, and that is to make more of itself. If you're the host and you get the virus, um, specifically COVID, you may get a little sick or you may get a lot sick or you may even get the ultimate bad sick. Uh, you may die. Um, the concern, the pr and some people don't have any problem at all. The problem is you don't get to choose. You get what you get if you get sick. The body has several defenses against viruses uh, and other pathogens like bacteria and fungi. Some of them are granulocytes that eat bacteria, and the others are lymphocytes called B and T cells. Um, the B cells make antibodies, which are what you want to get to fight off the virus and other pathogens. And T cells are the cells that talk to the B cells, and the T cells are the ones that identify when there's a foreign substance in the body. And then it gets in touch with the, T, the B cells and they work together to uh, provide defense. So while this works well, sometimes the body does need help. A lot of you take vitamins and mineral supplements and herbs and swear that your, your regimen works well and keeps you healthy all these years, and that's great. But as the commercial says, the coronavirus doesn't care. Once you get sick, you may get sick and you may need other things, much more than just vitamin herbs or supplements. So what is the purpose of a vaccine? It's to get us to make antibodies as if we were sick without actually getting sick. And that was discovered uh, initially by Edward Jenner, who was the one who realized that cowpox could make people somewhat immune from smallpox. Although he didn't know what immune was, he thought that it would work and it actually did. Because the cowpox does, doesn't affect people, but it gives you enough immunity that it protected against smallpox. So that's what a vaccine does, is it, it's trying to get us to have the body pretend we're sick uh, without actually getting there. And all the pains in the arms and the redness and swelling and fevers and so forth you get after a vaccine is a sign that the body is responding to that virus um, material. Um, and it's, you're getting an inflammatory process, and that's 
desirable. It usually goes away in a day or so. Sometimes it can be prolonged for a longer period, but it's a sign the vaccine is working. Um, in 2020, in December, when we first did this, there were 16 million people infected in the U.S. and 300,000 dead. Today, there's 30 and a half million people infected and 560,000 dead, uh, which is astonishing that in the last three or four months, we've had a, almost a doubling. Um, and it's still the same 1.8% of people that get sick die. It's still about two per, per hundred. Uh, mil, world, worldwide, there's 125 million cases and two and 0.7 dead, again, about 2.2%. So the virus is pretty consistent as to who it, um, who was susceptible and, and passes away. The vaccines usually are either attenuated, that is they're um, damaged so that they can't hurt if it's gonna be in a vaccine or it's killed. The, the Sabin vaccine you may remember from polio was on a sugar cube. Those of us who remember that, um, those of you who don't, I don't wanna to talk to you. Uh, those were attenuated. The Salk vaccine was a shot and that was a killed virus. Um, how long the immunity lasts once you get vaccinated can only be determined by watching people. And we haven't really been vaccinating people for COVID long enough to know how long immunity will last. There's hopes it will last a year, maybe a year and a half. Whether or not there's gonna, you're gonna need a booster, we're gonna, we don't know yet. Uh, there are mutations we'll talk about in a couple of seconds, but um, we don't know. The point is it, it's pretty much assured that it'll last at least six or seven months. Um, some vaccinations, you know, like the flu, you get yearly. Uh, others, like tetanus, you get every seven to 10 years. It depends on how the body reacts and how good the uh, vaccine is. Um, it used to make vaccines by growing them on chicken eggs, which is why they used to ask you and still do if you're allergic to, to eggs, because there's still egg proteins in some of those vaccines. And if you have, if you can't eat eggs because you have anaphylaxis, then you have to get another type of vaccine if they have one. But it takes almost a year to grow those vaccines on eggs uh, or other cells. The new vaccines are not made that way. They're, they're new methods. Um, all four of the COVID vaccines, the, the Pfizer, Moderna, the um, uh, AstraZeneca, and the Johnson & Johnson are made a new way. Um, and they all involve using DNA and RNA. So DNA is a string of genes that basically is the code for our bodies. It, it, it's the template for exactly what we are. It's the master SOP, if you will. And um, the DNA, however, doesn't do very much except sit in the nucleus and bark orders. What the person that does all the, all the work is the messenger RNA, which takes the information coded from the gene in the nucleus and goes out into what's the outside of the, the nucleus or the cytoplasm and tells the rest of the cell what to do. So in a sense, and there are thousands of messenger RNAs and there are thousands of other protein. So in a sense, the DNA is the CEO, if you will. The messenger RNA is the COO. And then there are thousands of RNAs and proteins, amino acids that are the underpaid staff that work for these uh, two entities. The messenger RNA will tell the muscle cell to make muscle cell stuff. The messenger RNAs in the lung tells the lung to make lung stuff. And the genes turn on or off so that you don't make a muscle out of a lung cell. That would probably be awkward. Um, there's a lot we don't know about, but we know enough to be able to help people uh, and, and get these vaccines to be useful. The COVID virus is a messenger RNA virus. There's no DNA in the COVID virus. So um, this virus works by when it gets inside the body, it's, its messenger RNA tells your cell what it wants it to do, which is basically to make more COVID virus. So it stops doing what it's doing and it just hijacks it. So the purpose of the vaccine is to prevent the virus from getting into your cell in the first place. And the cells can be anywhere in the body. The way it gets in is all these spikes. You, you've seen pictures of the vaccine with these spikes, looks like a mine that floats in the water. That mine, you can look at that um, spike sort of as a key looking for a lock. And the lock to fit that key is on your cell. So once the COVID virus gets in, that those spikes look for the lock, which are on your cell. And once they connect, the virus is brought into the cell. And then like a Trojan horse, it opens up and releases messenger RNA and takes over for the cells in your body. To what degree it does and how serious it is and what parts of the body are affected vary. And we're not gonna go into all of that. So 
once this happens, inflammation occurs, and if it occurs in your lung, your lung fills with with fluid, like a blister type thing, and uh, you can't breathe if your lung is full of liquid because air doesn't go across a liquid. You go ahead, your lung has to be dry so that air can move in and out when you take a deep breath. Those of you who have had pneumonia know when your lung gets inflamed and, and full of fluid and so forth, you can't breathe very well. The other problem that COVID causes, we now know, causes blood clots to form. And these blood clots may be the reason why some people just seem to be getting better and then all of a sudden they can't breathe and they die. It may be that they flipped a pulmonary embolism or something because the virus in some people stimulates blood clotting. And who is that going to happen? We don't know. Um, there's a lot we don't know. It's far better not to get sick in the first place and I don't have to worry about it. Hence the vaccine. And if the clot you know, forms in an artery, you could you, you get a stroke. Um, the other problem with the virus once you get it is that it mutates and the mutation may change the spike protein so that the vaccine or the antibodies your body's making may be less effective. Uh, generally, the, it does work for all the mutants and I will talk about that in a couple seconds. So the way Pfizer and Moderna make a vaccine is they take snippets of messenger RNA that code for the protein spike and they want to get it in your body. They can't just put it in the body. What they do is they wrap it in a little glob of fat called a micelle, which protects it because the messenger RNA would degrade very quickly. So it puts it in this little glob of fat and they, that is what gets injected into you. That little micelle is brought into the body and once it's in there, the micelle dissolves and the messenger RNA snippet codes your cell to make a protein, an antibody against just the spike protein, not the rest of, of the whole virus, but the spike protein. So that, and then that's released, the T cells uh, get revved up, the B cells start making the antibody. So when you see the real COVID virus, the antibody you've made based on this little messenger RNA that you were vaccinated with blocks that lock from fitting into the key. So the virus may be in your body, but it's not hurting you because it can't get into the cell. That's the idea behind vaccination. And it seems to work pretty well. So the, the reason that one uh, company needs virus uh, at a colder temperature is that they have different types of micelles. The Pfizer vi micelle requires a temperature of minus 70 centigrade, although they may be able to store it at warmer temperatures. They wanted to get it out as quickly as possible. So they didn't do all the testing that might have been done because it didn't matter if you could store it at minus 40. You want to get it into arms, as they say. So uh, the um, the vaccine from Moderna uh, has a different kind of micelle that you allowed it to be stored at a, at a somewhat warmer temperature, minus 40, which, you know, <laughs> is still quite cold, but it's, it's, uh, it's easier to store that way. So um, that's the purpose of the, of the different temperatures, and that's how the messenger gets in. This little globule of fat, the micelle, allows it to get in the body. Um, the, the difference is with the other viruses, the, uh, the uh, Johnson and Johnson and the um, uh, AstraZeneca virus uh, vaccines, rather, they are DNA, not RNA. What they have done is they have taken DNA uh, that is not harmful, and they've inserted the spike protein gene into that um, DNA of that um, that is not harmful, and they uh, then inject that into the body in a biological cover, and once that biological material with the DNA, the DNA with the spike DNA in it, it gets into the body, that DNA makes messenger RNA and that messenger RNA then goes on to do what the other vaccine does. So in a sense, and you can store that at room temperature because that, that vehicle of getting the uh, spike protein messenger into the body um, is, uh, can be stored at, at room temp at uh, refrigerator temperatures. So the difference between the other two, AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson, is they put a gene of DNA into uh, another um, into into other genes of DNA that gets put into the body, and then messenger is made from that. So they're like one step additional before the messenger RNA starts doing its thing. But it winds up with the same bottom line: you're making messenger RNA tells it the cell to make antibody against the spike protein to block the lock from fitting into the key. Uh, we know that the varying degrees of effectiveness, and you've seen 78%, 79%, what, we are, what the field is talking about now is that every one of these vaccines appears to be 100% effective from preventing you from dying. And that is the bottom line. Some of you fall asleep for days, some of you get red arms, some of you get aches and pains, 
Uh, some of you can feel your hair grow. Whatever it is, that lasts a day or two, but it's better than being in a hospital on a respirator for four weeks or having a blood clot or having an amputation of a limb, whatever. Um, and 100% of these vaccines prevent you from getting, from being hospitalized and getting um, and dying, even though there may be 70 or 80% uh, chance of, of or 90% of you're getting ill. If you get ill, you may get a mild cold-like symptoms rather than uh, some really bad other symptomatology. So it's not, like I say, life is messy, but it appears to be effective. And this apparently is true against even the mutants, as I know. And I listen to the same experts you do. I have a little more understanding of what they're saying, but it appears as if the vaccines that are out there are also effective in the bottom line from um, from death and dying, although there may be, you know, um, some uh, uh, ways to discuss this. That seems to be my understanding. As far as symptoms, we talked about the arms and the, and the swelling and the pain. There's also what's known as long haul COVID, which I think is a miserable name. It's for people who become sick and have chronic problems for a year or more. They feel weak. They, they can't think. The virus can get into your brain and cause damage to the brain. It can cause damage to blood vessels. It can cause damage to your muscles. Um, all of the cells of your body have locks that these keys can fit in. And it may, we don't understand yet, and I'm not about to tell you why some people have a long haul, other people don't even feel it. Why younger people seem to be able to dance half naked on the beaches of Miami and be fine. They come home, they kiss their grandfather, and he's gone in three weeks. Um, that's what they have to think about, not what their enjoyment and what they're doing, but their family. Um, so long haul, we're still learning, we're still understanding what all that is. Um, the infection rate in, in Connecticut was down to as low as 1.5%. It's now up to 5% again, because what happens is people, and this is true for all across the country, people are, are, are COVID uh, uh, toxic and they, they, well, that's actually a bad term way to phrase it. They're, um, they're jaded. They want to stop being quarantined and they want to get out. But if you let your guard down too quickly, it's just going to cause a flare because only uh, 25 percent of the population has gotten at least one shot. That's nowhere near what we need to protect ourselves. Now is not the time to let our our guard down. Um, and as far as long term things, just uh, the last couple of seconds here. In 1918, the Spanish flu, which was a misnomer because it occurred in Kansas, but they called it the Spanish flu. Um, the uh, encephalitis then, which killed millions and millions of people. Um, years later, many of those survivors went on to develop Parkinson's and they think there's a relationship. So if you get the virus, who knows what's gonna happen 20, 30 years from now. Um, and for people who have gotten the virus and have recovered, most people don't have any sequelae, some do. Uh, the trick is to try to get vaccinated to prevent things from getting, uh, getting sick uh, as long as you can. And if the virus mutates, um, as long as we have virus around, it can mutate. That's what it does. So if you can prevent the virus from spreading, you prevent mutations and things will get a lot better. So I'm going to stop there. And um, also the last thing I just to mention is that we have to vaccinate the entire world. If there's a part of the country like the continent of Africa that is not well vaccinated, the virus will just spread. It'll come, a new variant will come into JFK or LGA and uh, we're off to the races again. This is a global pandemic. It is not a pandemic in Wallingford or in the town in, in Connecticut. So we have to make sure everybody, uh, we're all in this together. So with that, I'm going to stop and go on to uh, uh, Dr., uh, to uh, Elsie Matthews, who uh, will tell us about uh, clinical trials. And uh, Elsie, it's over to you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I want to repeat the disclaimer to start with. Of course, this is topic is not from Pfizer, even though that's where I work now. I was at Bristol Myers for 27 years till Wallingford decided to close the doors. So moving over here into Pfizer, did a lot of this work on the vaccine data. So that's what I'm going to tell you, share with you my opinions, but I'm not representing Pfizer for the call, but been working on that Pfizer vaccine. So I'm gonna start with a high level overview of conducting a clinical trial, just to provide everyone with some background of what it's like and what has been done to get this COVID-19 vaccine into people's arms. And then I'll jump a little bit to about the manufacturing and a little more detail, uh, very little since Ed covered it on RNA because that's what the Pfizer vac vaccine uses. 
and then wrap it together with what the FDA review looks like. So on average, clinical trials take years before approval. And I know a lot of people focus on that. So the Pfizer vaccine that we've just put the trial data submitted to the FDA was an amazing 248 days from the time of the first patient getting dosed to the time seeking this emergency use authorization from the FDA. That's only eight months compared to the average of eight years. So very different. The full approval submission will probably occur sometime over the next month because we now have more data on all of those patients that were in the trial. Now, let's walk through the sequence of events to actually create a clinical trial. A protocol gets written, trying to demonstrate the science and designed to show effectiveness against the disease and the safety of a product. That's the real goal, those two things. In a randomized double-blind trial, which this was for the COVID vaccine virus, a vaccine study, it's a double-blind trial that neither the patients nor the researchers that were giving them the doses were aware of which patients received either active product or a placebo of sugar water. For this trial, for Pfizer, it was 50-50. You know, you had a 50 chance, 50% 50 chance of getting it, the active drug or getting the placebo. And some of the other trials, there was a different percentage of how many people were given the active versus the placebo, but same type of plan. The investigational product then needs to be manufactured as you plan where you're going to do these studies, labeled and ready for shipment. Contracts get created with many research sites globally to ensure that we can see the number of patients that need to be included and get different geographic representation as well as demographic representation. Volunteers that meet the inclusion criteria, for example, the right age, for Pfizer in this case, it was 16 and older, uh, Moderna was 18 and older, and Johnson & Johnson was also 18 and older. Uh, demographics or stable chronic diseases that could in interact with what's going on with the vaccine, and then they're recruited into the study. They go to their own research center. The researchers administer that vaccine according to the protocol and collect the data at each patient visit. For the COVID vaccine trial, many people were needed to actually manage, collect, review, and analyze the incredible amount of data that was collected in a short period of time. There were more than 40,000 patients enrolled in the Pfizer clinical trial in less than six weeks. So if you think about that, that's hundreds of thousands of data points that had to be managed by various people. And that's not typical for clinical trials. It's usually spread out over time and not that many patients at the same time. So a large number of coworkers of mine were reassigned from other projects to ensure quality, quantity, and the speed that that data was handled. So it took an army to actually look at this. So it wasn't something that just happened by coincidence. And that was similarly done for the other vaccines from Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca, who hasn't gotten the U.S. authority yet to approve that. So every trial had more than 30,000 plus patients. And so we're talking a lot of people around the world taking either an active vaccine or a placebo to help us gather that data to see the difference. So now I'll describe a little bit about the manufacturing which I think is important because people ask about this. And of any vaccine, it's typically done at a specific plant or facility that's owned by that developer, that company, regardless of the geography. However, in this case, where the world urgently needed a solution they, in distribution of the product, it's critical to have multiple locations across the globe to produce and ship this with what you've seen recently on the media is Johnson & Johnson even partnered with another major pharmaceutical company, Merck, to help them manufacture their vaccine, which is pretty much unheard of. Usually it's very protective within a company, but needing this as soon as possible, they partnered. The Pfizer manufacturing is being done in two different locations. It happens to be done in Michigan for the US distributions. And in Europe, they're having distribution through the Belgium site. And that's really to help with the special freezers and shipping containers. The cryogenic conditions, because this has to be kept cold, as Ed mentioned, are required for shipping and storage for this COVID vaccine. The messenger RNA vaccines really must be kept at that ultra frosty cold temperature. The Pfizer 
minus 70, like Ed mentioned, Celsius, and Moderna at minus 25 Celsius. They both require those storage freezers. So that's something different than Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. We don't normally store vaccines at that cold of a temperature. So it's a new challenge. As Ed mentioned, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are a new type of vaccine and using messenger RNA based for those low temperatures are necessary to keep the fragile components from really breaking down. Johnson & Johnson vaccine, on the other hand, is a different type of vaccine as Ed described and can really be shipped at the higher and warmer temperatures. So let me give you a little more description about the RNA where Ed was going with this, just because it's so different. We don't have other messenger RNA vaccines offered to the public anywhere yet that will be growing, but that is not the case yet. So I wanna repeat the point that freezing the RNA vaccines really keeps their fragile components from breaking down. That's the important part. So they'll be functional when you get them. The cold requirement starts with the difference in the chemistry between RNA and DNA. RNA is much less stable than DNA. And that's due to the difference in how the particular sugars that make up those respective backbones for the molecules. When your cells have a job to fight like an infection, they usually need to call proteins into service within your cells. The cells have to make new batches each time, and that's kind of a recipe for making proteins, which is stored in your DNA. Rather than risking damaging the DNA recipes, the cells instead make RNA copies. And like any Mission Impossible tape that you can remember, the messages self-destruct once they've been played. So the RNAs are quickly degraded once they are read. And I, there's a host of enzymes dedicated to RNA instruction floating around inside your cells. So sticking RNA-based vaccines in the super freezer prevent those enzymes from tearing apart the RNA. So that's the real reason for the freezing. And sure, that we'll be working on multiple ways to deliver that, but at this point it was get it to patients as soon as possible. So the frozen method was the guaranteed and known way. So not to waste more time in the research right now, if the product was working, get it to people and it's safe. So as Ed mentioned, the Johnson & Johnson used the DNA instead of the RNA formulation. And that's the difference. Again, just so people know how that works. AstraZeneca is similar to the Johnson & Johnson where Moderna and Pfizer are very similar to each other. So let's try and connect all this information together. I'll briefly summarize what happened when, the, when Pfizer went to the FDA to hear their advisory committee review their data. They, they reviewed the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccine data all separately. Each company went and presented their own data from their clinical trial. The Pfizer was first back in December. And at those meetings, the FDA said, we really have to make it a top priority that these vaccines can be consistently manufactured and with the highest quality standards. The current dose of Pfizer vaccine is 30 micrograms of two, day, of two doses, 21 days apart, so three weeks apart. Moderna's 100 micrograms, two doses, 28 days apart, so four weeks. Johnson & Johnson is one dose only for about 0.5 milliliters in that vaccine, and that can be given just once, and the AstraZeneca will be twice uh, once the FDA gives its authority and approval. That will be the first, first dose, and then the second dose will be four to 12 weeks after. The vaccines all induce neutralizing antibodies, so the FDA was pleased with that. The FDA meetings noted that we needed some data monitoring committees to actually meet and look at the unblinded safety data. Because remember, these were blinded studies. So no one knew who got, which patients got which active or placebo. So those data monitoring committees went ahead and what met weekly, and they were minimal side effects that they noticed. And when they looked at the unblinded data, so they got to know who had what. And there were things like redness, pain at the injection site and swelling, typical vaccine response. Most common side effects were fatigue and headache, and even those were not very common and not seen that often, so very minimal. It was concluded that the, they were all rigorous and robust trials, including more than the 40,000 patients each that I mentioned, with safety and efficacy across age, gender, and race. The ethnicity and demographics and various comorbidities were also very carefully produced the data. The vaccines were well tolerated across 
all the populations. So no serious safety concerns, which the FDA is always looking for. And now we have the three vaccines that have emergency use authorization in the US with AstraZeneca coming to follow to the FDA, I think over the next month. And for people in the US, there's many administration sites to receive vaccine shots. That's not the case elsewhere in the world. Our European friends are really struggling just to find a place to go and get the vaccine if it's approved in their countries. So we do have a pretty good situation. If people want the vaccine, they can pretty much get it here in the US. And especially in Connecticut, we've done a pretty good job. Steve will talk about that. In summary, clinical trials really demonstrate high efficacy and effectiveness with these strong profiles of safety. However, we still need to collect more data, like Ed mentioned. And I think the important parts, uh, we have different categories that we need to still look at. Younger children, under 16 years old, pregnant women, the variants that are coming around, if we allow the virus to replicate, then it will mutate, and then we end up with variants. And then we also need to know just how long of a duration this does last. So far, there's been almost six months of data, at least for the Pfizer patients that originally started on it. So we will continue to see how that progresses and how long the actual protection lasts. And there's an important note that the long-term data needs to be collected following a large number of volunteers. So what the plan is, at least for the Pfizer study, and I believe the other companies are doing the same, will follow all the original vaccination patients for at least two years post-dosing so we can get a very good picture of what's going on. And I think I'll turn it over to Steve from there. Well, I'll just pass the ball. Okay, thank you, uh, Elsie. Uh, Steve, uh, who's the Director of Health for the Town of Wallingford, um, we'll uh, turn it over to you now. Thanks, Dr. Snyder. Good evening, everybody. I hope all of you are well. Um, I'm going to cover a, a, a snippet of, of everything that's going on and really cover what, what everybody wants to know. When can I get my shot and where can I get it? That seems to be the two primary questions everybody has right now. So um, I'm just going to briefly go over kind of how everything has evolved in Connecticut to this point and kind of where we stand now. Um, as a, a member of the governor or governor's vaccine task force, I could say that obviously, and as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, who qualifies for a vaccine um, administration and when has obviously evolved dramatically over time. Uh, and I think what you're seeing more uh, recently by obviously by what the governor has done is that we're doing an age-based rollout um, really starting in mid-January was when they started to allow folks that were 75 and older to again receive vaccine and and subsequently as as phase groups have opened up um, administration has been done throughout the state. The real issue that I think many of us are quite aware of at this point is that the supply is not meeting the demand. And based on conversations we've had now with state health and, and other federal agencies, it, it does appear that in the coming weeks and months that um, supply will actually outpace demand they're expecting by some point around Memorial Day in June, um, at least in Connecticut, because as, as Ed and Elsie um, highlight is that, you know, Connecticut overall from the administration standpoint has done quite well with getting um, vaccine into arms, I guess, to put it so bluntly. Um, and again, I think a lot of that's based on how uh, it was rolled out initially where you had focus groups to work with. And then um, when you do that, it, it provides opportunity for certain segments to get vaccine. And now obviously we're down to folks that are seven, uh, 45 and older. And subsequently on April 5th, I believe it will be open up to the general public uh, 16 and older um, for Sick for folks that are 16 years old, Pfizer is the only vaccine that's available at this point, whereas Moderna and the Janssen vaccine, which is offered by J&J, &J, is approved at this point for folks that are 18 years or older. Um, I can just say that, obviously, when you're looking at local, from the local perspective in terms of administration and where to actually receive vaccine, um, I'm sure many of you are aware that we've been offering vaccination clinics as early as late December. Um, but again, Moving on now where you see uh, more recently this week, Stop and Shop is now offering uh, on North Colony Road in Wallingford is actually offering Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, Walgreens on South Colony Street is actually offering vaccine. Um, again, we have our mega clinic here at, uh, at Oakdale Theater, which is offering primarily Pfizer vaccine. Um, there, so there are more um, 
vaccination locations and clinics that are going to start to open up more. And I think what you're seeing is, is not only is there's more of a supply that's being provided by the federal government, as the subsequent phases and the uh, population groups are actually vaccinated to a percentage that is well beyond 70 to 75 percent in many cases, um, that frees up more vaccine for others. And so I'm sure we all remember early on, we focused on healthcare workers and those who are in resided in long-term care facilities. And I think subsequently, because of that, you've seen a drop in fatalities statewide, which has, you know, we're not seeing the same rate of fatalities. We're not seeing the same rate of hospitalizations. Um, I will say, however, I, I hope that in the future, the hospitalizations will, they seem to have plateaued somewhat more recently. Um, and what, what I think that from the public health standpoint, we're hoping that we end up where we were somewhere last summer, where um, without the vaccine, we were under 100 hospitalizations at some point in uh, midsummer. So right now we're hovering around that 400 marker. Um, as, as Dr. Schneider mentioned, the, uh, the positivity rates have been fluctuating and, and more recently have been increasing. And, and one thing I could say that I did pull away from my college courses is that um, in epidemiology, we talked a lot about with repl replication comes mutation. And the more replication that we have, um, the more that the uh, virus is, avail is uh, spreading in the community, it will replicate and it will mutate. Um, and obviously at this point, we're, we're all aware of the, the different variants. That's probably a word not many of us ever use in our normal daily lives. And now everyone's talking about variants and, and mutated viruses. Um, but to, to that point, I think, as Dr. Schneider uh, had, had alluded to, that there is the belief at this point in time that uh, the efficacy, there is efficacy in utilizing any of the vaccines that are available in combating uh, serious side effects from uh, COVID. And so that's a good thing for us, obviously, in combating this. I think the assumption is, is um, you know, hopefully when we, the state has opened, I say that in air quotes on March 19th has relaxed some restrictions, allowed travel um, and other things that we will not continue to see a subsequent rise in cases and fatalities uh, in the state. But I think that that's something that we're going to have to watch. Um, and I think over the next several weeks, we're actually in a really interesting spot where we're still vaccinating thousands per day in our communities. And at the same time, we're still trying to keep the rates low to the point where we could have some semblance of normalcy in our economy. So I think it's a very delicate balance right now that we're seeing in terms of administering vaccines versus spread of the virus in our community. So it's neck and neck right now. And I think we really, um, again, continue from the being a public health person, I just recommend that folks still remain vigilant um, as, as we move into the, into the summer. And, and the hope is, is that we will start to really drive these rates down throughout the summer and subsequently continue vaccinating throughout the summer in hopes that come next fall, we will not see that dramatic rise that we saw this past fall and into the winter. Um, Cause when we saw that some, you know, positivity rates over 10%, uh, qu quite dramatic rates, um, uh, especially New Haven County was hit dramatic, hit pretty hard uh, early on last year and then subsequently this year as well. So. Um, but again, really what, what has been um, something that we've done is while we're offering our clinics now, um, saw a change for us more recently was the state has delegated uh, the town health department to be the homebound coordinator for the municipality. So starting next week, we're actually going house to house and offering vaccine to those who are homebound. And um, we're also focusing on those who are uninsured or underinsured vulnerable populations in our community now that we have other partners in town that are offering vaccines. So um, one thing I will say for those that are struggling with finding appointments, hang in there. It's going to get better, I think, in the coming weeks. Uh, I think there'll be a, um, a mad dash come April 5th. But uh, subsequently, I think towards the end of April, you'll start to see appointments open up. Um, and really, uh, like I just saw on the um, <clears throat> what's the best place for information on vaccination locations, um, there's actually a website that we give out readily, and we've actually made it available on the town website. It's known as vaccinefinder.org. 
And not many folks are aware of it at this point, but essentially what you do is, is you go on vaccinefinder, one word, dot org, you put in your zip code and the radius in which you're willing to drive, and they'll actually provide um, a listing of the clinics in your area and if they're in stock with vaccine, which is actually a great opportunity. And they talk about, and they actually list what's available on that site. Um, so we've been fortunate where we've referred residents to that site. They've been able to get appointments the same day. Um, so again, I think it's something where, again, as the supply chain starts to um, meet up, meet with the demand, or essentially when we get to a point where we vaccinated those who are seeking it, um, we'll start to have that equilibrium where, you know, you're not going to have to search very hard to find, to find the vaccination location. So um, I think with that, I'll, I'll defer to questions, obviously, and give folks a chance to ask some questions. All right, we have a ton of great questions in the chat. I'm just gonna go chronologically. Um, okay, so Jane wants to know, um, please talk about the variants here in Connecticut and how alarmed we should be. Um, and I think the other, and then Ted followed up with a similar question. We have Brazilian UK and South African variants in the US now. What can you tell us about them and are new vaccines being worked on to combat them? So I think those are two good questions to put together. All right, Steve, why don't you take uh, the incidence of the variants and then Elsa, you can talk about the, the uh, manufacturer's approach to that. Uh -huh. Sure, Ed. Um, so here's what I'll say. So the variants, again, as I mentioned quickly, with replication, you will have mutation. And so I think a year into the pandemic, with the expectation is um, knowing the nature of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that it is going to mutate. So the understanding that um, I think public health and the medical profession has at this point is that, um, you know, as, as viruses replicate, they could either become more infectious or more deadly. Um, it appears at this point, we're seeing it be more infectious and along the same lines in terms of impacting mortality rates. But I still think that there's more that has to be learned about it. What I will say is if more people contract the virus, you will have more fatalities. So that's something we have to be mindful of in some of our mitigation methods as we move forward. I'll just add about some of the work that's being done for the mutants. The, some of the original trials from each of the manufacturers were done in some of the locations where those variants already existed. For example, Johnson & Johnson was done in the South African population. So they do already have some immediate data of what might be needed and how effective they are against it. Pfizer was done in South America. So we do have some of the Brazilian and Argentina mutants. And the UK had some patients for AstraZeneca. So each of the companies have done some work. Moderna has some as well, since they were global trials. And we continue to look in new populations to test them now with the variants and doing different um, in vitro testing in the test tube, uh, shall we say, instead of in patients first, to see how it counteracts the vaccine against that virus and mutant. So there is work being done. It is not a full scale trial like the original was because it would take longer, but we have seen that there is positivity rate against them for the current vaccines that already exist. They are working against many of the mutants. Yeah, I think um, the question was, what about the Brazilian and South African? All of those mutations are probably floating around Connecticut. Uh, people travel up and down. Um, I'm sure there's more variants out there than we've been able to put numbers to. Um, they're here. The hope is that none of them have such a dramatic alteration in their spike protein that the vaccines would be rendered uh, ineffective because it's no longer uh, blocking its uh, ability to, to enter the cell. Um, and all you can really do is just wait and see what the scientists come up with. They're doing more and more surveillance of, the, of, of where their mutants are here. Um, the, the thing to do is to just get every, vaccinated as well as you can, keep wearing your mask um, and distancing and so forth. One quick thing, someone may wonder why every time you hear about a mutation, it's always nasty. It's more infectious. It's it's worse. What, what are, aren't there any friendly mutations or, you know, mutations that don't cause problems? There are, but they don't survive. If you have a mutation where the cell, the virus can't enter the cell, it dies off and you don't hear about it, which is good for us, bad for the virus. You want to hear about the ones that survive. So you're not going to hear about friendly mutations that we're all hopeful will take over because that's not the way uh, life works. 
Great. So um, Gina has a couple questions about um, uh, blood issues. Um, so the vaccine alerts the B and T cells to be on alert and respond to COVID. For CLL patients, those cells are already on high alert and above the out of range for blood work. Wouldn't this vaccine aggravate people with blood issues? And the second question was, would the vaccine alter blood counts if someone is going for routine blood work? Uh, it wouldn't alter it because <clears throat> um, I'm not, well, I shouldn't say it shouldn't. I'm not aware of any evidence that um, giving a vaccine it raises uh, your lymphocyte count to the point where someone looks at it and says, gee, this person's got something else going on. Um, it changes the cells that are there to become sensitized for the COVID vaccine rather than making tons and tons of brand new ones only. So uh, there's not uh, just an increase in number, but in what the cells are programmed to do. And I'm not aware of any um, oncology patient group that has been advised not to get, there may, be, there may be some, and it may be depending on the stage. If you've just gotten a stem cell transplant, uh, obviously you need to talk to the oncologist about whether you should get vaccinated or not. Uh, but generally, uh, someone with CLL that is not, a, as, as far as I know, and I may be wrong, but as far as I know, it is not a contraindication to getting the vaccine. In fact, you probably should get it to protect you uh, because you may be more, uh, someone with that may be more susceptible. Uh, again, I have not heard of any of that. If anyone has, let me know. I, I could be wrong, but I believe it's okay. There are some, like I said, the stem cell transplant may be, depending on the time, the timing uh, they may want to uh, to hold off a little bit on that. Uh, next question was, how long after the vaccine does someone need to wait to get a mammogram? Uh, well, there's really no need to wait specifically. What you may have read about is that some people who, women who get the vaccine develop lymph nodes that appear to be uh, seen on mammography as possible breast cancer mets or tumors. Um, it turns out to be inflamed lymph nodes uh, in that area. And I think, um, um, although I personally haven't had a mammogram, I, don't, I would imagine that the mammographers ask you that question when you go to get tested. Uh, and they may take extra um, pictures or they may ask you to come back. Um, there is no formation of cancer due to that, but it, it um, can be uh, deceiving and give the impression that there may be something going on. Uh, so they may take some extra films to, uh, to ensure that it's not uh, something they're missing, but it is a reaction to the vaccine. Again, that's my understanding of it. Yeah, I think quite a few of the current mammogram locations are now asking how recently did you get your vaccine so they can at least have that on record. And if it's very recent, they may suggest you wait some longer time just so there's no uh, possible influence on the mammogram itself. Right. Do you know if any of these um, nodules are, are uh, can they be palpated, Elsie, or are they? No, uh, the internal? no, just internal. Internal, so you don't know they're there. It's not like you can feel something. Yeah, it's not like you'll feel it. Okay. Uh, next question, I believe this was answered earlier, but are these the first RNA and DNA vaccines? Uh, Elsie? Messenger, messenger RNA, yes. There have been other work with uh, approved ones, I should say. There have been other DNA work that has been done. Great. Um, can you comment on the British giving one vaccine to everyone first? Well, my understanding, and, and certainly Elsie can comment, and Steve <clears throat> may give some perspective as well. My understanding was they didn't have enough vaccine, and they felt that partial protection for a lot of people was better than full protection for a smaller number. So they chose to give one shot so they could spread the uh, supplies that they had around further rather than keep it for one group to get double shots. Um, uh, maybe Elsa, you can comment. And Steve, uh, has that been any consideration in Wallingford? And just quickly, I'll add to what Ed said and then let Steve tell us more about the local. Yeah, that they're really, Europe has struggled to have enough supply anywhere, but especially in the UK so that there was a real choice to use the supply they had to cover as many people as possible, hence the one dose only or a significant delay in getting the second dose. I think really um, a lot, uh, the CDC I know was very adamant about staying within the framework of the emergency authorization and, and having the two 
um, two dose vaccines be offered as two dose vaccines. Um, and that's why I think we ended up seeing the, the phasing nationwide that we did, how states implemented it was, were different. Obviously some states didn't do any phasing at all. They opened up to everybody, whereas Connecticut had the option to took, took the uh, position of we'll do it in phases. We'll do it in groups and eventually everybody will have access to, to the vaccine. So I think that that's kind of how you can, how locally and state in you know, state by state, they combated some of the supply chain issues. It's clearly suboptimal, but that's the way they chose to spread it out. Next question was, if someone is asymptomatic, do they eventually get over it? Or, or is it more like typhoid Mary and always shitting virus? I'm sorry, could you repeat that first part? I didn't <clears throat> if someone is asymptomatic, do they eventually get over it? Or is it more like typhoid Mary and always shedding virus? I, oh, I, I think the matter, if they get symptomatic, do they eventually get over it? Uh, if you're asymptomatic, you don't have symptoms. I wasn't quite sure if I understood. I, I think what they mean, and maybe um, Lois, you could clarify, but um, I think what they mean is that is if someone is asymptomatic but shedding virus, does it does it yeah. does that eventually stop? Do they stop shedding so virus? Typically, ten days is what the what the magic number is for those who are asymptomatic. And and realistically, let's just say I tested asymptomatic today. Um, normally, release from isolation would be ten days post test because then at that point they say you're not and you're not you have virus in your body, but not to the point where you're considered infectious in the community. Lois, does that answer your question? Yeah, I just didn't know whether it could ever be the situation like typhoid Mary where they never got over it because they don't know they have it if they haven't gone for testing. Is I, it eventually it's just work itself out of its out of your system? I, I would, I, I apologize for misunderstanding your question. I, I see what you were saying now. Um, I think there might be some people that might be uh, asymptomatic spreaders like typhoid Mary uh, type, sorry, Mary, do uh, <laughs> I mean, she wasn't a great person. So, <laughs> <laughs> actually, she wasn't. She uh, had multiple chances. They put her in jail and the whole deal. Um, I think it's possible. That's one of the reasons wearing a mask until there's herd immunity. Because while you may be asymptomatic, you may be spreading it to someone who isn't infected, uh, uh, and um, th that could happen. Uh, but again, if you're not tested, you wouldn't know that. And mm -hmm. most people clear it, but not everybody does apparently. I, I don't have numbers though. No, that's okay. a great point. Thank and I you. think that's, that's really where the universal masking came into play from a public health perspective is that, you know, once it was identified early on and that, you know, you could have, you could spread the virus without showing symptoms. That's where the universal masking really became a, really became important. Um, <clears throat> next question. I understand that the COVID and AIDS are both retrovirus seeds. <laughs> They're both retroviruses. Is there any, uh, evidence that people that are taking AIDS treatment are also getting some protection from those drugs for COVID? Um, I believe, yeah, I don't think that there's a concern. A retrovirus, normally what a virus does, if it's a DNA virus, it gets into the body and it starts making our messenger RNA and, and causing problems. What a retrovirus is, it's a RNA virus that gets into the body and using what's called the reverse transcriptase enzyme actually puts DNA into the, uh, the, the patient's own DNA and takes over. So it does it retro. It doesn't go from DNA to RNA. It goes from RNA, which this virus is like the AIDS virus, and it makes DNA copies and takes over the, the cell via the DNA pathway. Um, I'm not I certainly don't haven't heard anything, and I don't know Elsie or Steve that having HIV um, in any way um, is a contraindication to getting the vaccine. I don't believe that any. It's encouraged to give them the vaccine right. if you have that, as well as just recently, and and I know Pfizer announced it, and I'm sure the other companies are doing the same, that there will be additional studies starting now with protease inhibitors, which are very commonly used for the HIV disease. So uh, to be a therapeutic, not a vaccine, to help with people once they get COVID for the future. So in, in another way to treat the disease. Very interesting. Okay, next. Um, if the vaccine provi uh, produces neutralizing antibodies, do they eradicate COVID from your body entirely or does it become dormant? 
what would then happen when immunity wanes? Well, that's an interesting question. It doesn't eradicate it. It just, it may be there, but the virus in and of itself, unless it gets into a cell and can do bad things, floats around and doesn't cause any problems. The body eventually will get rid of it. Um, but um, it's, it's not that it lays dormant and then flares up again. I think it, it is possible to be reinfected with someone with um, uh, who's gotten it once, could probably be exposed to someone if they get uh, a large enough inoculum and, and get come down with it a second time. So you might say, well, if I got vaccinated, could that happen? And I don't know. That's an interesting thought, possibly. I know people who have been uh, diagnosed with COVID are encouraged to get vaccinated regardless. That I do know. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know if it, 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 it exactly what happens to the virus that can't get into a into a cell if the lock is broken, maybe they get bored and leave. I'm not sure exactly what happens, but uh, it doesn't seem to be, um, I'm not sure what, what, it's probably degraded and then, because if I, I don't know how long the virus normally would survive. If it's not replicating, which it can't, it can't replicate on its own. It needs a cell to do that. If it can't get into a cell, it can't replicate and then it goes away. That sounds good. I think that's right. <laughs> and I think too, Dr. Schneider, is that there's a lot of questions around those who are asymptomatic and, and not having symptoms um, in terms of BT cells or antibodies, what the threshold is that they're actually generating and that those folks may be reinfected subsequently later on. And um, so again, it's something that I know that that's been discussed a lot more recently. Yeah. The next question was, are these spike proteins by themselves harmful to the body or are they only a tool that the virus uses to enter the body's cells? My understanding is there's only a tool to get in, uh, then it takes over. And uh, the inflammatory process that occurs um, is what, um, in response, is what certainly causes lung problems. And if it gets into the brain, it can cause inflammation there and that would kill neurons. If it gets into the heart, it can cause death by cardiac muscle, and cardiac muscle doesn't replicate as well as other uh, muscle, uh, other types of muscle, cardiac muscle especially. So uh, it's it's the spike protein is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself, as far as I know. Elsie, you may have more information on that. No, I, I think you covered that pretty well. I would agree with everything that you've just said, Ed. So they look gross, but they're not the dangerous part. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> um, are accelerated tests being done to see how long the Pfizer vaccine protects an individual? Yeah, there's only one real way to test the length of duration of protection, and that's really to wait the time. There is some work being done in vitro, but it's not the same as really having those true patients that have been with the vaccine for an extended period of time. So we are monitoring all of them at this time. And the other companies are doing the same. Will the vaccine be available at doctor's offices sometime in the future? I I, I would think so. you know, it's funny, we, we, the process has totally taken out uh, the normal operators that have provided vaccine in the past. And so now we've created this superstructure of uh, providers that realistically will probably not be available come next year. I know a lot of these mega sites are probably going to, you know, be, they're on contractual basis. They're there for the short term to try and get mass vaccinations. And I would imagine the normal medical system would actually, you know, uh, once the surge passes, hopefully in the coming months, the normal medical system would take over. I don't know if, if Elsie or if Dr. Snyder has any comment on that, but that was my perspective. Well, don't forget the doctor's office would have to have a minus 70 freezer if the, if the um, Pfizer vaccine isn't uh, improved upon or studies don't show that it can be stored with a warmer temperature. Even minus 40, they don't have. They have regular refrigerators. So depending on the vaccine, uh, they could go in the doctor's office, but if they require the ultra cold temperatures, that would be problematic, I think. Yeah, I think if this becomes routine and the formulations can be matched up and you can have it in a normal situation in a refrigerator in a doctor's office, then that's where it would be. Like the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca would fit that right now. Uh, If length of immunity is thought to be several months, then what? Well, then you get, if it turns out that we still have active infection around the globe and vaccines are shown to have an immunity that lasts eight or nine months, uh, you get a booster. 
And, um, you know, the boosters, I'm not quite sure if they, you know, they tell you you have to um, vaccinate 300 million people. I mean, that's, that's an awful lot of people. When they say, well, they may have it by the end of June, even if you do millions a day, you know, if you do 2 million a day after 20 days, you got 40 million and you're looking at 300 million. I mean, it's it's a long slog to get all these people done. How they would do a booster, I don't know. That would probably be, I'd, I'd call Elsie and say, hey, Elsie, what are we doing here? Steve, can you help me here? I don't know. Well, I think that, you know, look at how we phased it in now. You would have to phase in the booster as well because people would be on that same cycle if that's the case. Yeah. We don't know yet. I, though. We hope it lasts longer than that, but... And that was a big question for us planning forward is, are we doing this again in December? Or are we doing this again in January? And, um, you know, I think that's something where, you know, depends if there's a seasonality to this similar to flu and something that, you know, we're hoping that maybe the vaccine lasts a little bit longer and natural immunity lasts longer. I think a lot of the evidence is just going to have to bear itself out over time. And, and because the messenger has to get into the cell in the way that it does, you can't take a pill, you can't drink a liquid, it can't go orally, it has to go intramuscular or parenteral, which is other than by mouth is the definition of parenteral. So um, it, it would be great if you could make a pill, then every, this would, a lot of things would, you know, it could go back to what, looking at concerts at the Oakdale instead of having a, uh, you know, vaccination Rama there, so. Although I think it's cool. I think this, I think public health is cool. It's just a personal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, this was touched on a bit, but what does the vaccine distribution look like around the world on all of the continents? And thank you. This has all been really helpful. Uh, Steve, Elsie? Steve, do you want to start? Think, yeah, I guess it's really different depending on what type of infrastructure each country has. Um, depending on your healthcare system, even state to state has been dramatically different. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware if you know paying attention to what's been going on in other states where you see long lines that re re resemble polio um you know where you have lines of folks first come first serve and and i know that um and i think it was wise that connecticut at least phased it in um you know what groups were you know available first maybe could be debated but again i think where you had do it in a controlled fashion makes more sense but i think as you'll see as as mentioned earlier in the uk where they're you know taking the two shot um, to, you know, two dose vaccine, making it a one and seeing if you could reach more people. A again, it seems to vary based on, um, you know, what the needs are in, in these different countries. Yeah, I think the other thing we've seen is really the difference in regulations. Every country or at least region like Europe has their own regulatory body where we have the FDA, Canada has their own HPV they really have set the rules for what manufacturers can do and what they'll approve as the data. So it is a little different depending on where you live. And then the, the inventory, of course, is the other big thing, get it, being able to have access once they do approve it. And then there were discussions about some countries having a larger population of people who are against vaccination, so-called anti-vaxxers in France is apparently it's a big problem. Uh, for reasons uh, they were talking that no one was really quite aware, but um, it, it is a problem until they get vaccines shipped all around the world so that everyone gets able to get herd immunity on, on a global basis, it's, um, it's, it's problematic. Uh, some people receiving first shot have side effects, but none with the second, others vice versa. Is there a reason for this? Yes. Um, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there are stranger things between heaven and earth that are dreamed of in your philosophy, Horatio, was what Shakespeare said. Um, we don't understand why that is, why some people have a reaction the first time, not the second time. Um, I do know that some people who have had the vex, who have had COVID-19 and then got a vaccine, had a much stronger reaction the first time than they might have expected because the body is now seeing the, the proteins, uh, the, the virus again, only not the virus, but the spike protein when it just got rid of it, having gone through the illness. So when they get a second shot after that, you think they'd really get slammed because that would be like the third time they're seeing it. So, uh, so those, some of those you can explain, but um, I can't explain why things, some of the things you talked about uh, 
are occurring. Everyone is so anxious to get back to normal, many may not hear the warning to wear a mask. Some people seem to think the caution is no longer needed after they get vaccinated. Are people getting the warning message enough? Another big question. Well, you know, they listen, but they do not hear. Um, yes, the vaccine, I mean, the president of the United States today gave a talk in Columbus uh, about, I think it was Columbus, um, about the um, um, affordable care you know, uh, anniversary. He was wearing a mask through his entire speech. You could hear him breathing through the mask. He was making a statement that we still have to wear masks. Those masks are gonna be with us for a long time. And um, yeah, as, if you're in the outside in the summer and you're frolicking around and you're socially distanced, fine. But if you go inside, uh, wearing a mask is, is prudent because as the virus could be um, in people that aren't vaccinated, uh, other, some people are susceptible. Uh, and everyone says wear a mask. The problem is wearing a mask, and I have to be very careful here, is becoming a political statement when it ought not to be. It's purely medical. It's only about whether you want to survive or not. Um, and uh, I think we'll be wearing masks for, for quite a while yet. Uh, Steve, what are your thoughts on that? And, and I think what, what seems to be occurring simultaneously is we're reopening the state and trying to return to some sense of normalcy while we're trying to keep infection rates low. So I think that it's really a giant experiment at this point, to be quite honest. Um, you know, that could totally change. And, in, in you know, in May, we could be talking about another surge if this doesn't go accordingly and some of the mutated variants really start to take hold um, and vaccinations, you know, keep moving forward. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stay positive and not in that kind of way, not in a COVID way. Um, you know, we, you know, I'll, 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 I'll say this, you know, I've always been told and that this, somebody said this, I've always looked for positive people in my life. Now I'm looking for negative people. Mm -hmm. So that's something that somebody told me early on in this, but, um, but again, realistically looking at it, I think that it's something that we're going to have to monitor. In all honesty, I think this is a this is something that you know not many of us are or none of us really are familiar with at this point. Uh, let me stop for a second and mention something I forgot to mention earlier: that the state um, is monitoring the incidence of the virus in wastewater. Um, when you're exposed to the vex to the virus, you start shedding it apparently in your stool um, and uh, other um, uh, you know excrement, and th that they started sampling it to look for the level of viral uh, particles and the number of genomes and so forth uh, that were present. And it uh, turns out that that is an incredible predictor of when people are going to become sick because you, you start shedding it and then a few months, weeks later you get sick. And then if you get sick enough, you wind up in the hospital. So that is monitored on uh, Steve would know far better than I. Um, I don't know if it's daily or weekly, but uh, it can predict quite accurately what the trends are, whether someone, and it's been level for weeks and weeks while we were having a low level. Uh, and then apparently it started to increase a little bit and sure enough, the levels have gone up. So Steve, can you comment on any of that? Yeah, Dr. Snyder, I, I believe what's happening is, is there are certain areas that received a state grant to, um, again, as you measure, measure virus particles and micrograms per deciliter, I believe they're measuring. And they could see roughly 10 to 14 days ahead of time that a potential surge is happening in a community. And we know that, um, you know, when you have a closed plumbing system, like, you know, wastewater system in a community, we know that all, all that wastewater is being directed into one area. So we know what, what our threshold is. Exactly. So it's a, it's a very interesting concept to look at it that way. And I, and that may be something we see more in the coming months that, you know, you have more sites looking at that. I think yeah, we even I, were talking about at the universities, correct, Steve? I think, you know, that was a way to monitor some of the campus correct. activities. Correct. Also for variants also by doing genotyping on the, um, yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah, I actually teach wastewater at Southern Connecticut State University. So there's a lot of discussion around. <laughs> um, and again, you know, sampling Long Island Sound, to be quite honest, um, mm -hmm. is probably something that's going to happen next because um, all the wastewater basically, <laughs> you know, goes south and ends up in the sound at some point, whether it's treated for, you know, um, was treated with chlorine, obviously, as a disinfectant. But again, that's probably something else that's going to be washed to the river streams and, and et cetera. I, I did post a tweet of the most recent data. <laughs> the Ryan Hanrahan, the weatherman, had posted it. Um, oh, great. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's such a 
<laughs> here. But anyway, um, can you comment on the recent reports about rhinovirus dominating the COVID virus? Rhinovirus dominating the COVID virus? Um, no, I can't. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I do know there hasn't been any, I think there have been maybe one case of flu in the entire state since the, vac since the COVID epidemic. For reasons no one understands, they're attributing it to wearing masks, um, in which case you might as well just wear a mask for the rest of your life because there's flu all over. Um, but I'm not aware of the rhinovirus um, taking over. Um, rhinoviruses are probably safer to, to be infected with than, uh, than COVID, so that would probably be a good thing. But I don't know. Steve, do you have any more public health information on that? No, no, I, I'm not familiar with that at this point. Okay. Do you think long haulers are harboring the virus in different tissues? I would think it would be likely if you're having, uh, some people say that they can't focus, they can't think very well. So you would think that there would be something affecting their cerebral tissue, their brain. Uh, people with um, who can't walk, they get tired, could be in the muscles, could be in the heart. Um, we don't know what effects, and the virus may be gone. This may be long-term effects uh, that have, have uh, lingering. And when these people will get back to normal, it may be a very, very slow process. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. We're, we really don't know enough about what, what's happening, but um, uh, we're, it's all being monitored, I, I'm sure, the so-called long haul. Can you comment on the recent reports that says in Europe, question mark, about administering different vaccine for second dose, i.e. Pfizer first, Moderna second, or vice versa? Yeah, uh, you know, the, that kind of activity is not in, um, commensurate with the type of uh, um, emergency use authorization. You're not allowed to, to do that kind of switching. So although you could look back and say, you know, why wouldn't it work? I don't know but there haven't been any studies on that. So Elsie, yeah. you can comment on that? Yeah, really no activity in that area. One, the various companies are still working on their full approval. So they want to ensure that they've got all the data that really matches up with what Pfizer did for their two shots, what Moderna did for their two shots, what Johnson & Johnson did for their single shot. But uh, the emergency use authorization is very different than full approval. And I don't know that that's typically shared with people. It's not that common to get emergency use authorization, but in this case, because of the pandemic, that was granted. And now full data needs to really be looked at. Medically, I don't think it would be a problem. It's more of a regulatory concern, but Correct. we have to follow it. From when the first trial started, how is the immunity duration being measured? They're measuring antibody levels else. Yep. Just, just measuring the antibody levels and monitoring that those are there and no different side effects that someone might have later on. I mean, we don't know from the vaccine. Antibody protein. Okay. If seasonal vaccination becomes necessary, can it be bundled with the flu shot? If what, I'm sorry, what vaccination? If seasonal vaccination becomes necessary, can it be bundled with the flu shot? Um, I don't, I can't, I, I, I can't give you a, an intelligent answer. I could say it sounds like it should be fine. Uh, has there been any talk in the, the uh, lunch rooms at Pfizer else on whether this is doable? None at all. The, the focus has really been on making sure the COVID vaccine is good for COVID and not really thinking about the others at this time. But if you think about it, we do get other vaccines compiled together, you know, so it's a possibility and I'm sure it will be looked at. And then again, maybe it's not good to get vaccines together, you know, depending on how they're working and how they're activating. Right. If we come so back in here and do this, we'll have more information for you, I'm sure. Yeah, that one will be coming. I'm sure that'll be a top question. Well, since we've gone over, I don't want to take up anyone's time any longer. So well, um, oh, I'm sure uh, okay. there's still 29 people and there were 30 maximum. So if people are willing to stay on, if we can do it, I, I don't have a problem. Okay. Well, I, I also have no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to be Well, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions, ask them now um, or 
we'll call it a night, but um, either way, thank you so much, Elsie, Ed, and Steve. You guys are, you know, informing the public, doing all the hard work. It's, it's huge. This is, you know, this is a massive global effort and it's just so, from my perspective, I think it's really, really cool and I'm proud to be in Connecticut right now. Looks like we do have some questions popping up. Um, with the fast tracking of this vaccine, has there been discoveries found that may help with other viruses, cold, Ebola? Yeah, I think the days of growing viruses and chicken eggs is gone. Uh, Elsie, you can comment on that. Completely agree. New methodologies, new formulations are going to help us to produce many new medications and vaccines. It's very different than if you had asked this five years ago. Necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely. And we haven't really looked at the others that were specifically in that question, Ebola and cold, due to the short time frame to really focus on the COVID virus. And thank the Lord for Dolly Parton, who uh, <laughs> helped fund Moderna. No offense, I'll see. <laughs> we, and Pfizer didn't take any of the government money either from warp speed. Uh, is, you know, it's just a matter of different companies needed different help at the time. And everything that's available is a bonus to all of us. So it, it's not really which company did what. It's just a matter of having something that can help us all. Yeah. And I think important to note, Whatever vaccine you're offered, take it. It's a good one. There's no, there's no hierarchy here. Correct. All right. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, everybody, for your questions, and um, we hope this was helpful. Um, Mary, uh, all I can tell you is that Typhoid Mary was not a amateur radio operator, so we want to her on that. So there you go. And um, thank you all very much for your attention and your questions and for sticking with us. We uh, hope this was helpful and um, we appreciate the opportunity to spread some uh, science and some knowledge and uh, happy to come back in some time in a few more months and see where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good evening.